Order. It's time for questions to the Minister of Justice, and we will start with listed questions. Uh, before we begin, can I inform members that question nine has been withdrawn? And I call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Principal Deputy Speaker, following a court case earlier this year, I was contacted by Naomi Long MP and a number of other public representatives. I decided to include offences under the Welfare of Animals Act 2011 in review of the legislation governing the referral of a sentence by the Director of Public Prosecutions to the Court of Appeal on the grounds of undue leniency. That review is now underway. Any proposals for change arising out of the review will be subject to public consultation following Justice Committee consideration. I'm delighted that the Minister is uh, minded to include animal cruelty offences in the schedule to allow them to be reviewed um, and appealed sorry, if, if they are deemed to be overtly lenient. The Minister will be well aware of not only the public horror at the acts of cruelty that, that were committed in the case that he refers to, but also the, what was a, a, appeared a, a very lenient sentence. The Minister will be aware of other cases in the system that may be coming down the line. I'd just like to ask him of the time scale that uh, such a change could be implemented to, to know whether or not they'll take impact on these particular cases. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, Mr. Agnew is a bit enthusiastic when he asks to give a time scale for implementation. Um, I can give him an indication that I would hope that we would have the consultation document ready by the end of this year for Justice Committee consideration. But as Mr. Agnew and others will know, the time scale for implementation of legislation is not entirely in my hands. I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm I uh, thank the Minister for his answer. I'm just wondering if there are any other uh, particular cases or uh, aspects that the Minister is considering adding to those schedule of cases uh, that could be appealed uh, to the courts by the Public Prosecution Service when he is doing uh, the proposals. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, Mr. Elliott correctly highlights that there is an issue about exactly what would be done. The reality is there has been a fairly limited number of referral cases up to now if nothing else, to ensure that when court decisions are taken, by and large, offenders know what the penalty is. But it's clear there is concern about the animal cruelty issue, as well as a number of other issues. It will be a fairly open-ended consultation, but if there are specific issues that any member wishes to highlight, I'll happily hear from them about particular points they might wish to make. The, the position is we cannot have everything referable, but it is important that we ensure that there is confidence in the law by allowing appropriate sentences in as many cases as we can manage through this process. Thank you. And I call Mr. Peter Weir. Uh, question number two. It is clear that dissident Republicans and also dissident Unionists are continuing to carry out criminal activity. This is conducted to fundraise and for personal gain, and also to exert control over communities in which they operate. The activity includes drug supply, robbery, including armed robbery, extortion, operating in counterfeit goods, smuggling tobacco, and fuel laundering. It is also clear that despite claims of public opposition to criminality and the perpetration of assaults and shootings against those allegedly involved in antisocial and criminal behavior, dissident Republicans depend on a wide range of criminal enterprises to fund their terrorist activity. I call Mr. Weir for supplementary. Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, I think the, the Minister's reply, though, is a little bit Amused by some of the, the wording. I'm not quite sure if Jim Allister is going to be flung in jail sort of later on today as a, as a dissident unionist. Um, uh, but could I ask the, the, uh, the Minister what assurances he give? We all would welcome the efforts that are being done by all the agencies to combat the criminal activities uh, of dissident Republicans. What assurance can the Minister give that the efforts that are being uh, brought about outside of jail will be matched by the efforts in jail? and in particular that uh, dissident Republicans will not get their way in terms of demands that they're making within the, the prison system. Well, I congratulate Mr Weir on his inventiveness in, with regarding the supplementary. Uh, I, uh, as I think the House is well aware, commissioned a review of the operation of the 2010 agreement by the independent assessors some time ago, and that uh, review is now completed and will be considered by me and by prison service over the coming weeks. I can certainly give the House a guarantee that the situation as it prevails in Row House and indeed in Bush House is very definitely not that which pertained years ago in the Mays Prison, and as long as I am Minister of Justice, it will not be. 
There are issues about ensuring the best possible use of staffing. There are issues of ensuring a good regime for all prisoners. But the safety and security of prisoners and prison staff is paramount in the work that is being done. I call Mr. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, would the uh, Minister indicate what level of contact there is between himself and his counterpart uh, in the Irish Republic in Dublin um, in relation to uh, monitoring and uh, taking action against distant Republicans? Well, I can assure Mr McGuinness that there is very good contact between uh, my department and Department for Justice and Equality and indeed uh, with, between myself and Francis Fitzgerald as Minister. Um, some of the issues which he's hinting at, I think, more operational issues for the PS9 and Garda Shikana, and indeed the good work which is being done by the two prison services in cooperation. But it maybe we'll hear a little bit more about the fight against organised crime and terrorism later this week. And I call Mr Ross Hussey. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy and Speaker. Can see, it. Thank you. Yeah, stay uh, could, I, could I ask the Minister, in relation to distant activity, could he advise the House as any knowledge of weaponry that may have had provisional IRA history that was used by these Republican terror groups? And could he also confirm that he would condemn unreservedly attacks on Orange Halls that are being masterminded at times by dissident Republicans? Well, Mr. Hussey uh, cleverly manages two questions. Um, the operational aspect of what weapons uh, are used today and what the history they may have, I believe entirely to those charged with operational responsibility. Uh, but I have condemned all acts of terrorism in this House on many occasions before I became Minister and since, and I am happy if he wishes to add uh, my condemnation of the attack on the Orange Hall at Kidi to that list of condemnations which I have made in the past. No such attack has any place in a modern civilised society. Such attacks should be resisted by all of us, and anybody who has any information which could help catch the perpetrators has a duty to pass that information, whether to the PSNI, to Angada Shikana, or through Crime Stoppers, if they prefer. Mr. Mr. Minister, would you like to explain his reference to dissident unionism in the context of terrorism? But in terms of the Minister being able to give a definitive and reliable assessment of the terrorist threat, can he tell us, as a devolved minister, is he in fact privy to security service briefings on these matters? Well, the position is quite clear, Principal Deputy Speaker. Matters of national security are matters for the Secretary of State. In certain respects, the PSNI, as indeed in certain respects, the prison service have responsibilities to the Secretary of State rather than in any way to me. But in a general sense, I receive occasional briefings from the Security Service alongside the briefings which I receive from the PSNI about the state of organised crime and terrorist activity. Thank you. And I call Mr Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number three. Principal Deputy Speaker, alcohol abuse contributes to a wide range of significant social problems, including criminal behaviour. I welcome the joint report from Addiction NI and FASA highlighting the significant cost to the justice system of dealing with this issue. The actions being taken by my department are set out in both the community safety strategy and the overarching strategic framework for reducing offending. My department is also a key contributor to the executive's new strategic direction on alcohol and drugs, which is led by DHSSPS. In terms of the range of actions my department delivers, these include the ADEPT program, which provides psychological and educational drug and alcohol programs for offenders. Young people admitted to Woodlands Juvenile Justice Centre are assessed for drug and alcohol misuse and the appropriate services put in place to support them. At a local level, PCSPs deliver alcohol-related initiatives, including through engagement with local drug and alcohol coordination teams. Most recently, PCSPs played an active role in the promotion of the No Booze on Board campaign, highlighting that it's illegal to drink alcohol on board a bus in Northern Ireland. My department has also been working with health colleagues on a joint health care and criminal justice strategy covering the health and social care needs of significant numbers of people who come into contact with the criminal justice system. Mr. McKinney for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. These, these figures are huge, and as he quite rightly points out, that they also affect the health budget to the tune of 900 million. Um, in terms of priority, though, 
uh, and given that these are also historic, um, would it not be appropriate for a, an executive task force to, ta to once and for all begin to tackle this problem head on? I think if Mr McKinney saw what I say of, of meetings of the executive, sometimes he wouldn't put so much faith in an executive task force. What I do believe quite seriously is that there is good close working between officials from health and justice as the two key departments in this area, because as he highlights, there are significant costs to the healthcare system as well as to the justice system from alcohol, alongside other departments as appropriate. The important thing is to see that the strategic direction on alcohol and drugs has effect across a range of departments and that all contribute where they can. And I do believe that that work is ongoing, but clearly, as we all know from the scale of the problem, there is much still to do. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, considering the link between alcohol abuse and the misuse of legal highs, is the Minister considering bringing forward any legislation to tackle legal highs, or is there any conversations with his Westminster counterpart in regard to that? Well, actually, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm not sure that there's that close a link between legal highs, so called new psychiatric substances, and alcohol. Um, as most members of the House, I think, will be aware, the specific issue of legal highs is a reserved matter. I have been in correspondence with the Home Office about it recently. Uh, Home Office has a report which I believe is due for publication uh, in the near future, and we'll wait to see what their proposals are. Clearly, one of the issues which is also relevant is the work which has been done in the Republic in recent years, uh, and some of the work which we have done making use of consumer protection legislation has had benefits to protecting the public in Belfast, in Oma and in Larne. So there are matters which can be used within our existing legislative framework, but clearly we'll be interested to see what further the Home Office proposes. Mr. Paul Given. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, given the impact that alcohol does have on the criminal justice system, whilst I appreciate it's not for the Minister to take forward, but would he support uh, minimum pricing of alcohol uh, given that you have, in some uh, instances, uh, water, soft drinks is much more cheaper than actually such a substance that causes such devastation. Would he support that, if, should it be brought to the executive? I'm glad Mr Given add, added that final rider. I was going to say I'm not sure as Minister of Justice I have a remit specifically to concentrate on minimum pricing. Um, I am personally on the record as having supported minimum pricing, so if he's asking would I support such a proposal were it to come to the executive, I'm sure if it was argued as cogently as, uh, as Mr Given and his colleagues would put it, it is highly likely I would support it. Call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, uh, given that over 50% of recorded domestic violence this year has had an alcohol-related element. Can the minister reassure this House that he's working with all relevant agencies to ensure that this particular type of violent abuse is eradicated? Well, indeed, that's one of the very significant issues. The, the latest statistics I saw was something like 57% of domestic and sexual violence was alcohol re related, which is a huge issue for this society. Um, I think it's one of the key issues which will come through in the joint strategy between uh, health and justice on stopping domestic and sexual violence as we seek to put together the work which has been previously done in two separate strategies. Um, it's also very noticeable that one of the, the key issues where there's been direct action on this, the pilots where police officers in G district in and around Derry have been wearing body cameras has actually produced now specific results relating to a domestic violence uh, incident. So I hope this is something which we will see further work being done right across Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Mr Dominic Bradley. Question four to the Minister, please. I am content that the procedures developed by the Northern Ireland Policing Board in relation to the recent recruitment of the Deputy Chief Constable were properly adhered to. While the Board is responsible for developing the process and running the competition, I have a role in legislation to approve the proposed appointment of senior officers. In light of concerns raised by a panel member, I sought assurances from the Board's Chair and Chief Executive in relation to the appointment process. I also met the panel member concerned and consulted with the independent advisor from HM Inspectorate of Constabulary. On the basis of the assurances received regarding the integrity of the process, I was content that there had been extensive oversight and scrutiny, and I approved the panel's recommendation. I'll call Mr Bradley for a supplementary. 
Gromil Mayogat, free last concolia, August Gumbuyakas Lishinara, a socked a ragra, August Boylam and Midshaw, a Ifrid. Can I ask the Minister, uh, would he agree with me that uh, those who have questioned the integrity of the, pro uh, the, the process, that uh, th that questioning does not help the uh, acceptance of the police service within Northern Ireland? Well, the position, Principal Deputy Speaker, was that I became aware that one member of the panel had withdrawn from the process on the day of second interviews and had expressed concerns about the procedures. I felt it was appropriate, given my role of ensuring the procedures were carried out properly, to, uh, to request that member to come to a meeting at the same time as I had a number of meetings with the Chair and Chief Executive and also, as I have said, with the Independent Advisor. On the strength of the assurances I was given, I am assured that the process was carried out properly and although a, one member expressed concern, I believe the other eight members were unanimous in the recommendation that they made and I believe that that was an adequate basis on which to accept the recommendation. I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, and in a sense, he answered uh, most of my question, but uh, could he just confirm that uh, concerns were raised directly with him by Katrina Ruan uh, in regard to serious flaws and anomalies within the process prior to your appointment of the new Deputy Chief Constable? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I think the, the correct uh, Timescale is that serious concerns were raised in the media by Ms. Ruan subsequent to me receiving a recommendation but being made aware of the concerns she had raised both from the media and from the Chair and Chief Executive of the Board. I deemed it appropriate to request her to meet me to explain the concerns she had put publicly but on the basis of the concerns she expressed and the number of discussions I had with others, I believe the appointment was made uh, properly and that's why I confirmed it. Thank you, Mr. Ross Hussey, and it's, you remain in your seat. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I declare an interest as both as a member of the Policing Board and as a member of the aforementioned panel? Uh, the fact that a member of this House uh, made public representations whilst the, the committee were actually meeting and whilst the interviews were taking place, in my opinion, was an attempt to politically interfere with the appointment process. And would you agree with me that that was the case? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm not in a position to attribute motivation to any member of these, this House. Heaven spare me if I did. But it certainly appeared to me that the concerns that were raised were not valid. And on that basis, I, I took the view of the majority of those who had been present in the room. Thank you. And I call Ms Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, question number five. With permission, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll take questions five and eight together. Members need to be aware that there is now clear evidence of a major gap in our ability to tackle serious and organised crime groups. That is why, on the 8th of September, I circulated a further paper to, amongst others, the main political parties, the Justice Committee and the Northern Ireland Policing Board, setting out proposals on the accountability of the National Crime Agency, which would enable us to achieve the full operation of the agency here. It is a comprehensive proposal which will create clear, transparent and significant local accountability and is the result of extensive work between my department, the NCA, the PSNI and the Home Office and has the full commitment of all these bodies to make it work. I am in the process of meeting the main political parties. The meetings to date have been positive in tone and I am hopeful that we can achieve a resolution. I have made it clear that this is the last attempt to do so in the foreseeable future. The current state of limbo has existed for too long. If we cannot achieve agreement now on the proposal, we must accept that it will not be possible to do so and start to work to plug the gaps as far as possible in our law enforcement efforts, which this has caused. The consequences of a failure to reach agreement on the operation of the NCA in Northern Ireland have already been felt across law enforcement. I would urge all members to support the current proposals so that our law enforcement agencies and our people can benefit from the skill, the expertise and the resources of the National Crime Agency. Ms Cameron for a supplementary. 
Thank you. Could I thank the Minister for his answers? Um, however, given the real concerns there are throughout the community um, about fuel laundering, sex crime, illicit drugs and alcohol, human trafficking and uh, dissonant activity, does the Minister believe that this situation is acceptable and are the people of Northern Ireland being left vulnerable? No, Principal Deputy Speaker, it is not acceptable, and clearly in a number of areas people are vulnerable. We do need to be clear that there are some issues, including some that Ms Cameron highlighted, which are actually covered uh, by reserve matters, and therefore the NCA is operational. But we also know that, as I highlighted earlier to Mr Weir, um, a large amount of organised crime doesn't check up on the legislative book before deciding whether they'll do reserved or devolved crime, and therefore there can be problems of taking action against criminal gangs if part of their work is in the so-called devolved criminal area. I call Mr Raymond McCartney. I thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers to date. But even today, I mean, there's, there's nothing which the Minister said as to why he believes that all members of the NCA should be subject to the exact same accountability mechanisms as all members of the PSNI? Well, the reality is, Principal Deputy Speaker, all members of the NCA cannot be subject to exactly the same mechanisms as the PSNI. But in terms of the paper which has been most recently been prepared, the accountability mechanisms for NCA activities go significantly beyond what would be the case in any other part of the UK and are as near as can be the same as they would be. The, um, the role given to the Chief Constable in approval of the actions of the NCA, uh, the role of the Police Ombudsman, who would have responsibilities for, amongst other things, civil recovery, as well as the actions of NCA officers operating in the reserve sphere as well as the devolved sphere, are all significant advances on what would have been the case and take them very much into the same region as the accountability of the PSNI. Could I ask the Minister, would he agree with me that crime around the, borders, uh, the border would be tackled so much easier if we um, had the National Crime Agency uh, devolved to Northern Ireland? And would he agree with me that the failure of Sinn Féin and the SDLP is actually helping uh, to allow criminals to get away with crime around the border by not having the National Crime Agency? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure that Mr Easton should simply highlight crime around the border because it's clear that there's a lot of organised crime which is not just related to the border. Um, and indeed, some of the issues on the border are some of those matters which are reserved where the NCA can operate. But there is no doubt that we are losing out at the present time. I could give the House any number of examples which would take rather more than the two minutes I have of where we are losing out, whether it be on issues of investigation um, into child abuse cases, um, including online child abuse, um, the work of Operation Notarise, for example, which was UK-wide but had to be carried through the, by the PSNI, whereas the NCA expertise was used in England, Wales and Scotland. Um, a recent example of money laundering where the root offence was around cannabis growing and therefore could not be considered by the NCA because the cannabis cultivation is a devolved issue. Um, issues about importation of drugs into the, uh, the UK where the PSNI were asked to carry out action on behalf of the NCA but officers had to be diverted to another serious crime and therefore there was a potential loss of things. All of those are examples and we see clearly on the civil recovery figures that as of 30th of June of this year there were only eight Northern Ireland cases under investigation compared to 19 a year earlier with gross assets being considered of £19.2 million rather than nine point, uh, sorry, uh, of £9.8 million this year as opposed to £19.2 million last year. That is a sign of the cutback in work being done on civil recovery because we can no longer deploy the NCA into that area of work. So there are clearly very significant issues and they all need to be addressed whether they're close to the border or in North Down or in any other part of Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Ms Claire Sugden. Thank you, Mr Principal. Deputy Speaker, uh, question number six, please. Principal Deputy Speaker, the outlined business case for the redevelopment of McGilligan Prison was submitted to DOJ Financial Services Division for scrutiny in August this year. My officials are currently assessing the content of the OBC and prison service officials have been working closely with them to address some of the finer details. Once FSD officials confirm their content with the OBC, they will submit it to the Department of Finance for approval. 
And I call Ms. Claire Sugden for a supplementary. Uh, Mr. Pr Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the uh, Minister for his answer. Um, is it realistic to assume that there is funding available for an outlawed business case uh, for the redevelopment of McGilligan Prison? I'm tempted to say Ms. Sultan should take that question to the Minister of Finance, but I shall try to answer it seriously. Uh, it is not clear at this stage what finance will be available, but the timeline that we're looking at is a phased redevelopment which would allow the prison to remain in operation whilst building work is done, which could potentially take until 2022-2023. On that basis, the capital sums required in any one year are relatively modest and within what we anticipate being the Department of Justice's capital budget. But clearly, uh, there is competition for priorities, and no doubt at some point soon, other members will jump up and refer to Hyde Bank Wood and McGabry, as well as any other uh, DOJ responsibility. So I do believe it is realistic, given the, uh, the planned phasing, but we will clearly have to see how things develop in the next CSR period. And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Uh, Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the long-running interest that myself and my constituency colleagues have had in, the, in this issue, and I welcome his reference to the phased development aspect of it. Will, will he ensure that when the uh, business case does uh, return, and he is making representations to the Department of Finance and the Minister thereof, that the case will be pressed very vigorously so that the phased development which he has alluded to can begin as quickly as absolutely possible. Well, Mr. Campbell really is asking me to put my neck in the noose with people from other constituencies as well. Um, I, you know, I believe what we have is a realistic programme, and clearly there are some areas which are a higher priority than others within McGilligan. Some of the accommodation is fundamentally not fit for purpose. So some of the cellular blocks need replacement as a very urgent priority. On the other hand, some of the, uh, the other facilities around learning and skills workshops, whilst they're far from ideal, do not require replacement on the same basis. So I'm sure the Minister of Finance, with uh, his customary uh, pleasant look at the needs of the Department of Justice, will take account of that, especially if one of his party colleagues, the Member of Parliament for the aforementioned constituency, were to lobby him along with me. And I call Mr. John Dallet. Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, in order for the Minister perhaps to uh, appreciate the absolute priority this should be, would he be prepared to spend a night in McGilligan Prison to experience the conditions under which the staff and inmates exist? Indeed, I would have no objection if he spent several nights on it. <laughs> It's actually quite interesting because I do remember on one occasion um, members of a, of a local council invited me to go and visit a Department of Justice courthouse and felt that they were going to decide that they would invite me to their courthouse, whereas in fact it was mine. So I'm not quite sure whether Mr. Dallet technically has the right to invite me to spend a night in one of my prisons. I'm also not sure that there are enough free cells since I can't imagine anybody would want to share a cell with me. Uh, on a serious note, I was in... Uh, McGilligan for a detailed visit uh, in the early part of the summer. I am well aware of the inadequacies of the physical accommodation within McGilligan. Certainly the H blocks, um, some of the facilities within Foil View, the open unit outside the prison, are of a decidedly third or fourth rate nature, and yet some exceptionally good work is being done. The day I was there, uh, over half of the prisoners in Foil View were out doing some constructive work for the benefit of local charities, community groups and churches, which is clearly the kind of rehabilitation work that is needed, but we do need to get the buildings fit for the purpose for much of the programmes which are being delivered in them. So I may not go and stay the night, but I can assure Mr Dallet I will continue to visit it daily. Call Ms Karen McEvitt and we're coming very close to time. Thanks, Principal Deputy Speaker. Speaker question 7. <laughs> The Code of Practice on the Appointment of Independent Members to PCSPs and DPCSPs contains provision to disqualify a person from appointment on the grounds of a criminal conviction and also requires applicants to sign a declaration against terrorism. Following appointment, the policing board may remove a member if, in the case of independent members, they fail to disclose a conviction or have demonstrably acted in breach of the terms of the declaration against terrorism or if they're convicted of a criminal offence. A revised draft version of the Code of Conduct was published for public consultation. 
last March. Responses were received on a range of issues from a wide range of individuals and organisations. None of those who responded raised concerns about the effectiveness of these aspects of the existing provisions. Whilst suggestions have been made about strengthening the declaration against terrorism, it is the same declaration which applies for candidates in district council elections. The relevant provisions of the Code of Practice therefore remain unchanged. It ends the, uh, the period for listed questions and we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions and I call Mr Trevor Lunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister if he is yet in a position to know how much he will have to reduce his budget by during the current financial year, let alone next year? And can he give us any assessment of what services may be under threat as a result? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I am not in the position to give members a firm answer to that question. The likelihood is that we will be looking at something in the region of a 6% cut in this financial year, which, given that we're as near as halfway through it as could be calculated, is a very significant in-year cut, which will potentially have very serious consequences. In addition to that cut, um, some spending areas across the department will make uh, larger cuts, or will have to make larger cuts, because of issues like the cost of legal aid, uh, where there are real challenges and we have not yet uh, got assembly agreement to some of the changes which I have been proposing for some time. So the reality is we will see potentially cuts of 12 or 13 per cent in some of the core services of the department. We are also likely to see, as the Chief Constable has said, a potential end to recruiting of police officers in this year. We have already seen circumstances uh, in which the probation services had to lay off temporary probation officers thereby reducing concerns uh, of supervision of offenders in the community. Uh, it's highly likely that we will see some prisoners locked up for longer, despite good work which is being done by the prison service around rehabilitation of the kind I was just talking to Mr Dalit about. So all of those are almost inevitable consequences, even though we do not yet have a firm figure. Mr Long for a supplementary. Yes, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Would he agree with me that uh, the longer it takes the executive to make decisions around these issues, the, the harder it's going to be to make the savings required? And that, on the back of that, that uh, perhaps uh, it, it requires urgent executive attention and that, and that the First and Deputy First Minister might, might profitably use their time on these issues rather than swanning around Glen Eagles at the Ryder Cup? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I couldn't agree more with my colleague on the necessity of the executive as a whole in addressing these issues. Um, those who read the Belfast Telegraph on Friday will have seen a graphic which illustrated um, information which was given from a very senior level in the civil service that every day's delay is currently costing a million pounds to the Northern Ireland executive. As the minister responsible for the third largest spending department, I see a large part of that impacting on the Department of Justice. And given the cuts which have been made in the current CSR period, where we have had significant cuts because of the link to the Home Office and the MOJ, it is absolutely clear that we are now on the point that it can no longer be done by cutting the back office. There will be real impacts on frontline public services, real impacts on community safety, and real impacts on the issues of concern to our community if we cannot get this matter resolved very quickly and, indeed, it's now almost inevitable there will be those significant impacts, however quickly the decisions are taken. So I agree entirely of the necessity, as indeed I proposed last week, that the executive should clear diaries and concentrate on these issues. Question two has been withdrawn, so I call Mr Oliver McMullen. Garam, I got pretty last call you. And can I ask can I ask the Minister could he explain why he has imposed severe budget cuts in the Ombudsman's office and the policing board? given that, that they are vital to building and maintaining confidence in policing and the criminal justice system? I believe every part of the justice system is equally vital. The reality is the, the cuts which are being made are being apportioned as fairly as they can be, taking account of the range of pressures that exist. But to suggest that we should somehow keep the Ombudsman's Office or the Historical Inquiries team going at full pelt whilst not protecting the public today would I believe be a dereliction in my duty. My duty is to police the present, to provide a justice system for the present, to provide probation officers and prison officers for the present. And there's a reality that unless all parties get agreed on dealing with the past, we cannot allow the justice budget 
to be completely hidebound by the problems of the past to the expense of the present and the future. Mr McMullen for supplementary. Would the Minister agree with me that the accountability and oversight mechanisms by their nature should be exempt from any cuts? Mr. Speaker, I can't agree that anything should be exempt from cuts. We have made good efforts to protect those mechanisms and good efforts to protect the front line for the last four years. But the failure of other executive ministers now means those cuts are inevitable. Thank you. And Mr. William Irwin is not in his place. So we will move on. I call Mr. Roy Beggs. Minister, I am aware of pregnant women who continue to approach health uh, service professionals um, to be advised that their child cannot survive. Can the Minister update us as to what discussions and cooperations he has had with the Department of Health to update the legislation and update the guidance uh, governing the situation to minimise the risks that will exist to the mother's life and well-being? Well, Mr Beggs raises a very serious question, Principal Deputy Speaker. There are a number of different aspects of abortion legislation which I believe need to be considered. Uh, one which has been raised is the specific issue of premises in which lawful abortions may be performed, which is a matter purely for the Department of Health in its regulation aspect, although there may be assistance requested from justice. The others uh, relate uh, to the issues of termination on grounds of either fatal fetal abnormality or sexual crime. I have a document which is close to publication, which I hope to be sharing very shortly with the Justice Committee, and will then publish for consultation to deal with those two aspects, which are the responsibilities of the Department of Justice. Indeed, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a further communication from a young woman who found herself in exactly the position that Mr. Peggs describes. And I do believe that this House is going to have to face up to the difficult issue of how we resolve the concerns of those women, many of whom do not find themselves in a position where they previously have described themselves as pro-choice, but who, faced with the, uh, with the fact they are carrying a fetus which is not viable, have to consider the dreadful question of how that's affecting them, how that's affecting the lives for their families, and how they will respond in the future. I hope that we will get the opportunity for, to hear the voices of those women within a fairly short period of time. Supplementary. Could the Minister outline uh, the attitude of the Minister of Health, uh, either uh, the previous Minister, Mr. Putz, or uh, Minister Wells? Uh, is he satisfied that there has been reasonable engagement to try and resolve this matter? Well, the position from a public statement from the previous Minister, when I had written to him suggesting that we should do a consultation about all aspects of abortion on a joint basis was that he believed it would be confusing to put the health aspects in the same consultation paper as the justice aspects. On that basis, it is his responsibility to consider the health aspects, and as I've said to the House, I have a paper which I trust will be out for public consultation before the end of October, which will put forward proposals on the justice aspects. Thank you. Ms Maeve McLaughlin. Can I ask the Minister to outline to the House why former members of the RUC Special Branch are involved in vetting information for controversial inquests, given the history of collusion, their history of collusion in, in state murders? Well, the reality is this is an issue which is both uh, of direct relevance operationally to the police in terms of how they carry it uh, through and uh, relating to inquests which are currently in process and in neither circumstance would it be me appropriate for me to comment on it. Ms McLaughlin for supplementary. And I note uh, the, the, the Minister's response to that, but surely the Minister would have an opinion as to how this process would actually contribute to confidence building within the nationalist community in terms of policing? I repeat there may be issues of public confidence, but as Minister I cannot interfere in a process which is not mine, whether at the coroner's level or the policing level. Thank you. Mr Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what efficiency he's asking the, the Chief Constable of the PSNI to make this year? 
Well, technically, Principal Deputy Speaker, I don't ask the Chief Constable to make any efficiencies. It is an issue for the Chief Constable to consider in conjunction with the Policing Board on the basis of the budget allocation which is being made. And as I've said earlier, it is difficult to be clear. I told uh, Mr Lund that we were looking at efficiencies probably in the region of 6%, but it is not yet clear what that position is. We badly need to know more, certainly. But at a level of something like 6%, it is almost certain that police recruitment would stop this year. It is almost certain that a significant number of civilian staff on short-term contracts would be replaced by police officers. And the good work which was done by Matt Baggart, taking police officers from behind desks and putting them onto the streets, might well have to be reversed in a way which would be detrimental to public safety. Withdrawn. For a supplementary, I'm very sorry. Um, can I just ask the Minister then, what about police officers who are investigating crimes from uh, historical crimes? Uh, is there any chance of they've been taken off that and being put to frontline service to make up for those who, who are going to lose at frontline? Well, again, Mr. McCollin is tempting me to go too far into the operational area, uh, but I understand that the Chief Constable's expectation is that he would have to prioritise the needs of today in a way which would result in some officers being removed from some of the historical work being done. I mean, there are specific things, whether it be the HET, some other historical work, obviously issues arising from the Savile Inquiry, uh, there was a team involved on. All of those will potentially see a reduction of staffing because of the need to put uh, officers onto frontline duties today. Thank you. And uh, as you're saying, question eight has been withdrawn. So I call Mr. Michael McJimsey. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in South Belfast, uh, we have had a series of issues around drugs, as indeed have other colleagues in other constituencies, uh, the discovery of cannabis factories. Uh, we had a, uh, a uh, drug supplier, so-called Andre, riding his bicycle around South Belfast, well documented in the Sunday world uh, in, in the area. We have seen legal highs and deaths as a consequence. Is he satisfied that police in South Belfast are winning that uh, battle against drugs, or does he believe that we need a further investment and more resources? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, I could agree on all the points we might make in this chamber about more resources, but the reality is, because of the current behaviour within the executive and general budget pressures, there will be no more resources. Uh, there is no doubt that there is a drug problem arising across Western Europe, if not further afield, uh, which affects Northern Ireland as well. That's why we are attempting to enlist the support of the wider community, for example, with the number of social landlords who were involved in the launch of the scratch and sniff card to alert people to the smell of cannabis, as well as information given to them about the signs of cannabis growing, because that is a, you know, a significant issue of some quite industrial scale growing of cannabis and on average two discoveries per week of such a process. All of those are issues where, frankly, it cannot be left to the police. We need the support of the public and we need a joined up partnership. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But of course, it's not simply a police issue, we're aware of that, it's a societal issue. But it's also uh, one of the very strong arms against uh, uh, the drugs trade are the courts. Is the Minister satisfied and comfortable with the punishments being uh, meted out by the courts when uh, cases are actually brought forward before the law, or does he consider that an increase in the tariffs would now be appropriate, and will he look at uh, the, the, the options for stiffer penalties through the courts for those people found to be peddling effectively instruments of death? Well, I think, Principal Deputy Speaker, our penalties in Northern Ireland are basically comparable to penalties that they exist in the other two jurisdictions across the UK. I'm not sure it's the, the legislative penalty that is much the issue as what some members might feel about the penalties which are actually imposed by judges in individual cases. Uh, but of course that is something which I referred to earlier on as potentially looking at the issue of referability. Thank you. And I call Ms. Katrina Rian. Garamagat, the previous can call you. And I wonder, um, is the Minister aware that in recent fair employment monitoring, uh, Grafton recruitment outlined that for associate staff for the PSNI, 9.6% uh, were Catholic, uh, male or female, and 84% uh, 
were from the Protestant community. And, uh, this is one of the first times that Grafton have provided uh, information, a breakdown. And I wonder would the Minister uh, like to uh, maybe explain these figures to us? Principal Deputy Speaker, I, mean, I, I, I talked earlier on about what my responsibilities were, but to be asked to explain the actions of a private sector company is beyond even the wildest dreams I would have of what my remit might be. And I'm afraid we're out of time. And